This video is sponsored by War Thunder. July 4th, 1961. A Soviet submarine drifts beneath the Atlantic. Inside, three maintenance lights are flashing, each signaling an issue that needs immediate attention. If the Soviet Union is attacked and their most advanced submarine isn't ready to strike back, Captain Zetayev will become a traitor destined for life in prison. There is no time to waste. The K-19 submarine is made up of nine compartments divided into three key sections. The first light is at the front in the captain's quarters and operations. The secret communication line linking them to Moscow is offline and needs to be reconnected. Midship holds the nuclear weapons. The fault here means the missiles can't be armed. If attacked, they'll have no way to respond. At the back are the nuclear reactors with the third warning light. This is the most serious failure yet. If it worsens, it could be fatal. Captain Zetayev starts at the front of the submarine. It's quiet, but that won't last. In front of him are six torpedo tubes on storage racks, each with the force of 1,500 sticks of dynamite. These may be powerful, but the strongest weapons are in the middle of the submarine. There are a few temporary beds housing the most junior members of the crew. The best living cabins of the high-ranking officials are in the next room where the first error code is. In a submarine, very few people have their own private area. Zetayev's room has a picture of his family. Life on a Cold War submarine is the most dangerous post in the Soviet military. One fault can be fatal. In the corner is the intercom radio. He inspects to see what the problem might be. It seems to be a blown fuse. This is a quick fix. Zetayev gets the engineer to make the change and heads towards the control room to see if this first light has gone out. He knows that fixing the next two maintenance lights won't be so easy. Here are the officers' rooms. Despite being shared, they are still considered luxury. The same can't be said for the crew's living quarters at the back of the submarine. Officers sleep near the control room, since that's where they spend the majority of their time. The captain heads inside to check if the first maintenance light has gone off. Everything from the ship's navigation, sonar detection, and torpedo targeting are all controlled through the periscope. The captain looks at the maintenance board and sees that the radio light has gone out. One down, two more to go. The threat of war is constant, but so is the fear of Moscow. If high command hears about unready weapons, someone will take the fall. The second light needs to be fixed immediately. Anything shown up on the radar? Zetayev asks. All's clear, answers the soldier. Captain Zetayev enters the middle section, the part of the submarine that holds its deadliest and most classified secrets alongside the second maintenance light. Three 13-meter tall silos. Inside are R-13 ballistic missiles fitted with nuclear warheads. Each of these has over 66 times the explosive power of Hiroshima, enough to erase New York City in seconds. Now the Soviet Union can launch nuclear missiles right from America's coast, making an attack faster, harder to detect, and more difficult to stop. But right now, they are defenseless. Why is there an error for the missiles in the control room, says Zetayev. The silos are overheating, so we switch them off. We've searched everywhere, but can't identify the problem. If the problem is not here, then where is it, responds the captain. It must be due to a malfunction in another area, says the soldier. Pipes and wiring being exposed might not look pretty, but it makes it easy to spot problems and make instant repairs. Normally it's quick, predictable. This time, it's not. In the back of the captain's mind, his worst fear begins to take shape. This isn't just a missile problem. This could be the result of that third maintenance light in the reactor room. And if he's right, this submarine is more than defenseless. It's a ticking time bomb. Suddenly, Volkov rushes through the door. The nuclear reactors. I have never seen anything like this before. You must come immediately. All it takes is one overlooked component, and everyone's life is at risk. That's why War Thunder is so great, because they didn't overlook anything. It's the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made and is available for free on all platforms. Join over 95 million players in epic PvP battles 
with an unmatched wealth of high-quality content to discover. War Thunder's custom dagger engine delivers smooth performance and stunning visuals, even on low-end PCs, allowing anyone to experience intense combat with ultra-detailed vehicles, realistic graphics, and sound effects. War Thunder features one of gaming's most realistic damage systems, with each vehicle's components individually modeled and affected by enemy fire. The X-Ray View lets you see exactly where a shell penetrated and the components it affected. Command over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships from 10 major nations, spanning from 1920s biplanes to modern jets and tanks. There are countless camouflages, decals, and decorations for all vehicles. Play War Thunder free on PC, PlayStation, Xbox, or mobile. New players and those inactive for six months on PC and consoles will get an exclusive bonus pack including premium vehicles, the Eagle Valor Decorator, 100,000 Silver Lions, and seven days of premium account. Use my links in the pinned comment or video description below. The deal is ending soon. On his way to the reactor room, Zateyev walks past the diesel fuel generators. They are switched off for now, but should both nuclear reactors fail, they'll provide enough power to get the submarine home. Due to the advancement from diesel generators to nuclear power, submarines can now stay submerged underwater for up to 20 years, if not for the crew's mental health, need for food, and oxygen. The captain enters the reactor room, the location of the third maintenance light. Volkov points at the dial. The nuclear reactor is at 300 degrees. If we reach 600, the reactor will explode. If something is not fixed soon, a full nuclear meltdown is imminent. A Chernobyl, but underwater. Nobody would survive. But it gets worse. It's the height of the Cold War, and an explosion of this size so close to a NATO base could be mistaken for an enemy attack, risking the start of World War III. What about the backup, replies the captain. Due to the rush construction, there isn't one. We need Korchilov, he knows the reactors best, and we'll be able to figure out the problem. Although, he is sleeping in the crew compartment right now, replies Volkov. Let's get him, replies Zetayev. He presses the emergency button and sirens start blaring, waking everyone up. This is not a drill. These two reactors work like small nuclear power plants. They split atoms of radioactive material which releases heat. This heat turns water into high pressure steam, the steam flows through the turbines in the next room, spinning them to generate electricity and provide energy for the entire submarine. The turbines then connect to the propellers, which allows the submarine to travel. But all this only works if the reactor is controlled at a stable temperature. Right now, the balance is collapsing, and they don't have much time left. Before reaching the crew's quarters, they walk into the auxiliary compartment. This section is often the difference between life and death. There are tools stacked away in case fixes need to be made, alongside backup toggles for the control room in case the main room gets damaged. The alarm is loud and everyone is rushing to their stations. Underwater, sound travels over four times faster than in air. A single dropped wrench could give away their position to sonar arrays listening hundreds of miles away. But right now, giving away their position is the least of their problems. They enter the crew's living quarters. Multiple hard, triple-stacked bunk beds are hanging on the wall, maximizing space. Only a couple of toilets and wash basins. There are no showers, meaning the crew goes months without bathing. We need Korchalov immediately, shouts Zetayev. Here, Captain, Korchalov responds. They rush back to the reactor room to identify the problem. Time is running out. Korchalov inspects the reactor, and it's not good news. One of the reactor's cooling pipes is broken. If the temperature does not decrease soon, we are all dead, says Korchilov. Zetayev grabs a nearby radio. He immediately turns on the distress signals in case anyone is nearby and puts in the commands to connect with Moscow. Are you hearing me, says Zetayev. No command, no rescue, no hope. The worst time possible, the submarine's long-range radio systems are not working. The ship? Now, a ticking radioactive time bomb. Unexpectedly, a nearby vessel picks up the distress signals. This is a United States Navy warship. Do you require assistance? Over. We are saved, suggests Nikolai Korchilov. A lifeline from the enemy. 
In his hands lies the power to save 139 lives, ensuring every man on board sees their family again. Tateyev radios back to the ship. No assistance required. Situation is under control. The K-19 is carrying top-secret nuclear technology and warheads. If the U.S. boarded the submarine, then they could gain intelligence on Soviet reactor and weapon systems. Surrendering military secrets could mean treason for the entire crew. They are on their own. And now, everyone knows it. Captain Zetayev calls an emergency meeting. What he's about to ask is unthinkable. They are running out of time. The plan is to go into the reactor chamber and connect the drinking water supply to the air vent valve. This will cool the core, stabilizing the reactor. There is no plan B. I need volunteers, Tateyev says. The engineer crew are the only ones with the expertise to safely carry off this job. 23-year-old Korchalov steps forward. Before the voyage, he was with his family, playing volleyball and enjoying life. Do you know where you're going? Asks Zetayev. I know, comrade, he replies. Going inside the radioactive reactor is a death sentence. And still, seven more men follow. The engineers work in teams, rotating every 10 minutes to limit their exposure. The first group goes into the reactor. Captain Zetayev starts his stopwatch. They start cutting a hole in the air vent valve. But the pipe is thick. The components around the nuclear reactor are all designed for safety. The first group stumbles out. They vomit over the submarine floor. Radiation is already burning their skin. Get them to the med bay, Zetayev orders. Next group, get ready. Inside, they have created a hole in the air vent valve, but it's not big enough yet. The second man is cutting the water pipe from the wall. Two more rotations fly by. The vent is finally big enough for welding to begin, but it's taken longer than expected. The men have just 75 minutes before the reactor will explode they are running behind schedule. After connecting the water pipe to the air vent valve, they start welding them together. 45 minutes pass and another four rotations. The weld is getting closer to completion. They might just do it. There's hope. We have a problem, Captain, Korchalov says. There's little ventilation and moisture is forming. Condensation is making it harder for us to weld. We risk making a weak bond that could easily break. A solution must be found, or time will run out. The next team swaps in, carrying torn clothes and towels. This will hopefully keep the surface dry enough to create a strong weld. While Evgeny exits, he falls to the ground and vomits, spitting blood. His organs are failing. He doesn't have long left. The final group rushes in. The weld connecting the drinking water to the air vent valve is complete. The pair exit the reactor. But has it worked? The only thing left to do is wait to see if the weld holds. Korchalov and the others are taken straight to the med bay. His face is blistered and the skin is peeling off. Here they have tools. However, nothing can stop this intense level of radiation. The doctor gives him morphine and a picture of his wife. Nothing is stronger than the will to survive. In the reactor room, a shout breaks out, then another. It's cooling. Captain Zetayev rushes to the control room to see if the error lights have gone. They're still on. They have done it. Against all odds. But at what cost? They saved 131 lives. They stopped a nuclear war. But they couldn't save themselves. Exposure to 400 Rentgen can be fatal. Korchalov and the other engineers endured 5,400, more than 13 times the lethal limit. Several engineers lost all their skin and hair, while others were too weak to stand by day two. All eight men died within days. 
Even the crew who did not go into the reactor suffered the radiation, with 14 more deaths within the next two years. At the height of the Cold War, a disaster like the K-19 would damage the Soviet image. So, the cover-up began. Families were given vague or false explanations. Medical reports were sealed. Survivors were ordered to stay silent, with threats of prison for speaking out. The men who saved their ship and possibly the world erased from history. For decades, the story remained hidden. Only in the 1990s did survivors begin to speak. In 2006, the crew finally received medals for their bravery. They were never meant to be remembered, but now they are. Not just as sailors, but as heroes who gave their lives to stop a catastrophe the world never even knew it narrowly escaped. Remember to sign up to play War Thunder for free and claim your exclusive bonuses with the links in the comments section below.